I came in 1988 to help the Democrats to a town called Mount Sterling. Anybody here from there? And I went to a deal called Court Days. I had so much fun, I still remember it. With a lady I've been told is in the off, uh, audience here, Wanda Terry, who told me she thought I'd be president someday, and at the time, only my mother believed that. So you are one <laughs> smart cookie, Wanda Terry. I thank you very much. In the years when I was campaigning and running for president, I came to Kentucky as often as I could, and you were good enough to vote for me in 1992 and 1996, and for that, I will be eternally grateful. I thank you so much. And I was last here, I think just last year, when my friend Muhammad Ali's museum was opened on a wonderful night, which I think was uh, important historically for the city and the state. So for all of that, I am grateful. I am honored to be here tonight, honored that I was invited by Chairman Lundigan, who's gotta be one of the best state chairmen anywhere in America. The guy's overcome with enthusiasm. I would be remiss if I, did not, if I didn't say one more thing about the past. I am profoundly and forever grateful to Wendell Ford for the support, advice, and counsel he gave me when I was president and the help he gave me as a senator from Kentucky and as a personal friend. I thank you for being here tonight, and I thank you for everything that you have done. I, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Years after the 9-11 Commission issued its report, we still have not implemented its recommendations. We've always been told we couldn't afford to because we have a deficit. But I left them a surplus, in case you forgot. <laughs> I, uh, this economic recovery is amazing. We've had, according to The Economist, five years of economic growth, a 40-year high in corporate profit, CEO pay averages 369 times the pay of the average employee in those corporations, worker productivity has gone up five years in a row, and yet wages are flat, poverty among working families is going up, and the number of work, percentage of working families without health insurance has increased by 4%. We're spending 16% of our income on health care. No other country spends more than 11. We only insure 84%. No other country insures less than 100. General Motors has got $1,500 a car in health care costs. Toyota has 110, and we want to keep our auto jobs. Nobody's doing anything about it. Here's how we finance the deficit. You know how we do it? Every day that governments are open for business, America goes and knocks on the door of the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Saudis, and the British. They're our five biggest bankers. And we say to them, would you please loan me some money to pay for Bill Clinton's tax cut and our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan? Our kids will pay you back with interest. We don't use those words, but that's what we do. We borrow money from countries, some as wealthy as we are, most much poorer. Our tenth biggest banker is Mexico. Go figure. The Republicans say they are really in a lather now about illegal immigration, although they had six years to do something about it, and they haven't. And they talk about how terrible it is, but think how much less there'd be if the Mexicans, instead of loaning money to us to pay for my tax cut, would spend that money on education and jobs in Mexico so people would stay home and not come over here trying to figure out how to send money home to their families. Now, we have to have an economy that grows together here. And we can't do it with all these big deficits. And it's made Social Security worse. I noticed the other day in the paper, the president said he would, quote, revisit Social Security after this election. Now, when I was in college, that's what we called a euphemism. 
Revisit means I'm going to stick a fork in that sucker when I bankrupt it after the election. That's what that means. And they never tell you that if we wanted to switch over to their idea of private accounts, the transition costs alone would cost another trillion dollars. So it's something that you ought to tell people to think about as we come on these congressional races. We have serious security challenges, serious economic challenges, serious health care challenges, serious education challenges. We all have, so have enormous opportunities. And the truth is that the Democrats have fielded the most impressive array of candidates that I can ever remember. You see the ones you have here, John Yarmouth and Colonel Mike Weaver, but look at them. I mean, they're really impressive people. Look at their bios. In their class of candidates this year, we have nine Iraq War veterans. Nine. One in Pennsylvania, Patrick Murphy, who won the Bronze Star in Iraq. One in Illinois, Major Tammy Duckworth, who lost both her legs in a helicopter crash and now campaigns proudly as a Democrat with her cane on her two metal legs, one of which carries an American flag sticker. They call us the cut and run party? I don't think so. We have running for the United States Senate, uh, Ronald Reagan's Navy Secretary is our nominee in Virginia, Jimmy Webb, most heavily decorated graduate of his Annapolis class in the Vietnam era, running as a Democrat. In Kansas, a state the president carried two to one just two years ago, <clears throat> there are 11 people who left the Republican Party to run for office as Democrats. Eleven. The Democratic nominee for Attorney General in Kansas was a Republican prosecutor until he left to run for office. The Democratic nominee with our governor, Kathleen Sebelius, the now the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor in Kansas, was the chairman of the Kansas Republican Party until 2003. People are coming home to us. And why is that happening? Why is that happening? Partly it's because the economy is not what it cracked up to be. Partly because people are sick of the partisan gridlock. Partly because people are sick of all the special interest dealings in Washington where they've doubled the number of lobbyists in only five years since I left office. It just took them five years to double the number of lobbyists where we've had unprecedented special interest dealings and partly because people know that all this ideology and division and ignoring facts and evidence and arguments, no way to run a railroad. But we have these really impressive people. And that imposes on us a staggering responsibility. Senator Ford and I were talking about it earlier. In this election, for many voters all over America, the Democratic Party has become both the progressive and the conservative party of America. You think about it. If you're conservative on the budget, you got to be with us. If you're conservative on crime, you got to be with us. They got rid of a program, put 100,000 police on the street. You heard mayor talking about it earlier. And now there's a headline in the press that all these mayors all over America are concerned about rising crime and violence. They don't have the support they need, and they're going to the White House to demand that we reinstate it. If you're conservative on the management of our military resources and their proper deployment, you got to be with us. That's why you got all these big time military people helping us. And if you're progressive, if you don't think it's right for Congress to keep raising their pay without raising the minimum wage and you want a Congress that'll say no more pay raises for us till we raise the minimum wage for America's working people, you got to be a Democrat. And If you're tired of compromising our national security, endangering our children's environmental future, and not generating good jobs, and you realize that if we made a commitment to a clean, independent energy future, it would be a boon for America's farmers, a boon for small towns and rural areas, and create millions of jobs all across this country, and you want a clean, independent energy future, well, then you've got to be a Democrat.